As these caregivers, as in me, age, it's a huge worry about what's going to happen to my kid when I die. And I mean, that's the thing that I think about a lot and that one of the main things that people ask me about. Where I see, you know, individuals with families with resources, they're the ones who fall through the cracks. So where can our loved ones with serious mental illness live? So many people with serious mental illness wind up unhoused or in jail or living with their families or in places paid for by their families because we simply don't know what else to do. The guests on this episode will introduce you to two housing situations that can fill the gap between unhoused and cared for by your family, and they're happy to share how they got it done and how it works. Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. Welcome to Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches, episode 105. We're really excited about this episode because we're going to be talking about possibility and solutions. I'm Randy Kay, author of Ben Behind His Voices, here with Mindy Greiling, author of Fix What You Can, and Miriam Feldman, author of He Came In With It. We call her Mimi, as everybody calls her Mimi. And we are three moms. We each have sons with schizophrenia, and we've written about the journey so far. And in many cases, the journey continues. I, Randy, want to start by thanking our family of listeners so much. Episode 104 was a story where Mindy was out legislating and doing some advocacy work. So Mimi and I were here with Rachel Strife and we spoke about the importance of signing a petition to remove some of the limitations on the administration of Clauseril. They're called REMS. And so many of you signed the petition, and I'm so happy that you you came forward to support it. If you haven't heard the episode, please refer to at least the show notes of episode 104. The more people sign that petition, the greater the chance that we can make a difference in rules that actually keep a very helpful medication sometimes away from our loved ones. I also was able to share a, we're in a crisis state with my son, Ben. What goes around comes around, sadly, sometimes. And I just want to take a moment and thank so many listeners who commented on our YouTube channel or wrote us fan mail on our website or wrote to me directly to, number one, offer empathy, which I so appreciate, but also to share that they were really glad that I was brave enough to tell the story. Things are not going perfectly, far from it. And to know that our story helped somebody else is a, a silver lining and, and huge. And I thank you so much for reaching out and sharing how hearing that episode helped you. And also for those of you who shared equally harrowing stories with me, right back at you, the empathy and the love. So, you know, thank you so much for being in our family of listeners. Anytime you need to reach any of us, there are links on our show notes or it's called a description in some of the websites. And there's also our Facebook page and you can join that and join the conversation. And so thank you. Me and Randy, before we go into our program, I just have to say, I did have a chance to listen since I wasn't here. Like you said, I was meeting with, with a, a legislator and a judge, and we we're planning some legislation for the coming uh, session in January. So otherwise, I would have loved to have been here. But um, when I listened to it, when we started this podcast and we all read each other's books, you know, our family was the only one that had been in the criminal justice system. And so I'm sorry that you joined us there because we've been there. We know what you're going through. And to add um, the criminal component to um, psychosis and substance abuse is, you know, a toxic, horrible combination for 
any family. So I'm so sorry you're going through it. And the fact that the pro, if I had been there, here's what I wanted to say. The program, here sits Rachel Strife, you know, the, the queen of clozapine advocacy. <laughs> and <laughs> no one said, can't, as long as you're his conservator, as long as he's in the, uh, has been in the courts, you know, it seems like it's a missed opportunity not to get him back on clozapine. I even talked about it with Dr. Leitman when Jim had his meeting with Dr. Leitman that we have, you know, once a month just last week. And he too said, Randy needs to get her son back on clozapine. Is that, I know you've been advocating for it, but could you just give us a cliff note of why that isn't happening? That's a, a very good point. Thank you. And if you've you've just joined us for the first time, uh, Dr. Leitman is a friend of the podcast we've had on several times, and we're going to have him on again next month. And <clears throat> he is a nephrologist who knows how to combine medications so beautifully. So when his son uh, developed, came down with, was diagnosed, let's say, with schizophrenia, he and his wife went to work and they they found a way that administering clozapine correctly in the right combination, along with you know exercising and other things that go in the program, <clears throat> that it can be done really successfully and without many of the side effects that affect people. And he's written a book about it. So if you haven't listened to that episode, his book is available on Amazon and that book has opened the eyes of many psychiatrists around the country who are reconsidering. Clozaril is not the only medication in town, but for many of our listeners, we have found that it's the best. I know my son did the best on it, uh, but you know there are drawbacks, and so we're working on it. And we're not here to advocate for any one particular. You know, we're not branded. We're not sponsored. We're just three moms talking with other people about how we can best treat our sons. So why can't I? tell my son what medication to take. Legally, I'm not allowed to do that. The only thing I am allowed to do as his conservator is if he's in the hospital, I can ask for a hearing or the hospital can ask for a hearing for right to medicate over objection. Unfortunately, the patient has the choice of medication. And I'm never allowed to say you must take this med and no other med. It's just not anything. I don't know if it varies from state to state, but in Connecticut. And by the way, the right to medicate over objection goes away the minute he's out of the hospital, which is why I met, I actually contacted, you'll be very proud of me, Mindy. I actually contacted <laughs> a state representative in Connecticut to ask for a meeting Yay, to sponsor- God. Um, and assisted outpatient treatment law in Connecticut. I figured I'll just take a step. I don't know what I'm doing, but there's- I am proud of you. Good. Yay for so, Randy. Thank you. So <laughs> she got back to me right away. And um, so I'm I'm going to be learning the process. So I'll be calling you for advice. All right. So, and, yeah, and I should you. say for our listeners, Connecticut is the only state left that doesn't have such a law. The only oh, state. They, you are an outlier. Massachusetts just went through last year. I thought year. there was one other, though. I thought there were two left. Maryland. But, Maryland was last year, actually, not Massachusetts. Uh, Maryland, it, Maryland was the other one. So now you're the only one. All right. So, well, I can do my luck. best. As we said <laughs> last week, turning our pain to purpose. So with that in mind, I will say I, I should give you an update that it's it's not better right now, except that I have blocked my son's number. Because it's right now I'm dealing with addiction first and schizophrenia second. So I am getting whatever support I need. He's gotten himself in a really bad situation. The good thing is that he is housed in a housing program similar to what we're going to learn about tonight. And so I'm not completely alone in this. And I was able to meet with his case manager and the head of the housing development yesterday and they're going to meet again on Friday. So I'm not leaving him high and dry. I am leaving him in the hands of other people who, who can help him better than I can. He's not out on the street. He is housed. However, if he continues the way he's doing and it disturbs the other people in the housing unit, he may lose his housing. And this is where when addiction comes to the picture and you act in a way that causes breach of peace and annoy the other residents, 
It adds something to it. I am, I'm hoping for sobriety and doing what I can. So that's where we are right now. And right now, the only way I can find peace is to block his number. And it breaks my heart. I'm not going to lie. It breaks my heart. But I don't see how else I can help him right now. So it's a day-to-day -day process. Maybe by the next episode, I'll have a, a better update. So again, thank you, Mindy and Mimi, for your support. I know you've texted me during the week to see how I'm doing. And thank you, listeners, for stepping up to the plate as well. So speaking of housing, we're, we have two guests we're so excited to have on. Uh, Linda Kaufman from Synergy Programs, and it's spelled with a P S N P S Y N E R G Y. Synergy, like synergy, but you put a P in front of it. And uh, she's toured many programs serving individuals diagnosed with severe mental illnesses like our sons. And she's going to tell us all about it. And then Ellie Skelton, Executive Director of Touchstone Mental Health, which also is dedicated to providing innovative person-centered care, <clears throat> pardon me, person-centered care for individuals affected by mental illness. She's a champion of housing first and trauma-informed approach. So Ellie and Linda, why don't you join us, please? Here they come. They're turning on their cameras and welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Mindy, I'm going to turn it over to you because you brought these two wonderful guests to us. And why don't you, Linda, can you adjust your camera so we see your whole face and not just, there you go. Great. Thank you. Doesn't thank matter you. to our audio only listeners, but on YouTube. <laughs> there. Okay. Thank you. So Mindy. Yeah. So I want to welcome these two guests that I had the privilege of inviting and I met Linda, when I was in Italy last summer with um, a group of people from Minnesota, and she was there with a group of people from California, trying to learn about the Triesta system of community health care, which does include housing, supportive housing, not a lot, we found out, but the model they have is really good. Um, they're recognized by the World Health Organization as the gold standard uh, but on housing, I think they is the one area that they could learn how to have um, more of it like we do. And Ellie Skelton, I met actually last January when I went to a meeting that I helped initiate with a bunch of people that are interested in housing. And I noticed that she was the person in the room with the most uh, sparkle that everybody looked to whenever anything was, people wanted to know the answer and she just had all this charisma. And um, so, and then when this group of our NAMI, Ramsey County, our NAMI affiliate is learning about housing, I've been hitting that up for a couple of years. So we toured two places in Minnesota and the first one we went to was Touchstone and a, a place called Rising Cedar that Ellie can tell us much more about, but we learned so much that day. And I have to say, um, I am really excited that Jim is going there. And so I'm going to be in real time on this podcast, getting to educate our listeners about how that goes, because it's a process, mm -hmm. I am thinking, and how it's going to go for him and how it's going to go for us parents. So stay tuned on that. But I'm so thrilled that both of them are here. And we always ask our guests if we remember, if you are family members, and then how did you, each of you, get into being such advocates and leaders in affordable housing that's supported for people with serious mental illnesses and mental illnesses? So uh, Ellie, why don't you start? Since you're from Minnesota, like I am, and then Ellie from California, like Mimi used to be, we'll have her go, them go second. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Um, I've been listening to a few of your episodes and watching it on YouTube, and that's been pretty cool to see the advocacy work you, the three of you are doing. Very impressive. Um, I was especially struck by your uh, episode on marijuana. I have a uh, my oldest child is 26, and they recently went through treatment the end of last year for cannabis use disorder, and they had this condition called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, so they would have cyclical vomiting that wouldn't stop, and they ended up in the ER 
multiple times over a two year period where they'd need IV drugs to stop um, the nausea and for the, just for the vomiting to stop. And it's, it was just really challenging. I mean, to be a family member, um, to just know that they need to go to treatment and know they needed to stop and it wasn't helping their mental health. Um, we have a lot of addiction and mental health in my family, which is one reason I was drawn to this work. My brother is in long-term recovery from a really difficult heroin addiction he had for over 10 years. And now he is getting his licensed alcohol and drug counseling certificate and doing some work in harm reduction in Northern California, a needle exchange program, and he's perfect person to do that. And so it's recovery works, treatment works, and there's recovery is a journey, as we all know. So I just started this work in college. I actually started in 1992 and kind of fell in love with the behavioral health field. I've worked in substance abuse treatment, mental health care, eating disorder care. And now I'm kind of back to where my heart is, which is working with adults with serious mental illness. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Linda. Hello. Ellie, you sound amazing. <laughs> I think I need to meet your brother, known in California. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, to answer the first question, yes, we have, uh, same as Ellie was saying, we have mental health in our in our family. Um, a recently diagnosed loved one um, was diagnosed at 17 with schizophrenia um, predisposition and then marijuana. Um, you know, kind of led to that. And of course, trying to work with him and the mild, staying in the mild, <laughs> like that, that, that's my goal. Um, and how I came to this work, I moved back from Ithaca, New York uh, to Santa Cruz. And, you know, I, I needed a job. And my sister-in-law's friend was writing an RFP for a, a housing project, a, a unique model of offering housing and mental health services all in one uh, unit, one building. Um, and so I helped them write the RFP and then they were awarded the contract. And um, and that was in 2001. So that's how I started, you know, before that, prior to that, I was in baking uh, from age 17 to uh, my 40s. And so the last 20 years has been in uh, supporting people specifically a little bit different maybe than, than Ellie, um, where our passion is and you know, it was helping people move from locked psychiatric care back into the community. And there's some stepping stones that go with that. Um, one of the things that I've come to realize is every state who's very different, and then every county um, has different rules and regulations. But I think that California has a robust um, different types of IMDs. Um, and levels of care that I think is helpful when you talk about those continuums. Um, so that's how I came to the work. I'm very comfortable uh, with people with mental illness. Um, I just am. I worked in a locked facility for, for two years um, in the community. I serve on NAMI Santa Cruz as a board member for 15 years. Um, I'm an ambassador for Treatment Advocacy Center and AOT. Yay for advocating for the AOT. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, it's it's my comfort level. And also I ultimately do not feel, um, and I would say synergy also does not feel like people heal in a locked setting. It has its place, I think, for safety. Um, but some of our clients have been in secured settings for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, and that's where I feel like some change can happen. One thing before, I know Mimi has another question, but before she asks it, I just wanted to, Brandy, you can probably help us out here in the show notes, but when we we had two brothers on from California that mm -hmm. traveled around the state mm -hmm. looking for um, what, looking for housing for their one of their children, and they picked Synergy after you know spending months traveling the whole state as the best place for people with serious mental illnesses to get supportive housing in California. They were written up in the New York Times. Mimi and Randy remember the, that program, right? Yes. It was two mothers, I thought. It was two yeah. women. Yes, two mothers. Oh, I thought you said Teresa. two brothers. I'm like, yes. Oh, Teresa, no, mothers, I'm sorry. Sweeney mothers. And Lauren Richard. <laughs> That's Tully. right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. wonderful women, powerful, and have made tons of change in California. Just 
just two people, just like you mm -hmm. three ladies, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty incredible, actually. So yes, they are uh, power. Um, and yes, I think that would be great to put that episode in your um, notes, because I think they made they have made a huge difference in California. Hey, thank you. And we also have episodes about Treatment Advocacy Center and Assisted Outpatient Treatment. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you know that the the uh, thumbnail of the show pops up so you can see it. I will remember to put it in because we have 105 episodes now. So you have to be hunting through them to find it. So if, you, if you're if you new to the podcast, I, I have heard from people who like, I started listening in episode one and I'm now on episode 44 and you're welcome to go through all 105 of them. But if you don't want to do it chronologically, you can just pick the episodes that resonate with you. So um, thank you for bringing that up, Mimi. Now, Mimi and I are both <coughs> coughing a bit. So we're going to try not to cough when the mic is on. That's the deal. All right. Well, I have a question that I guess each one of you will need to answer separately. But I'm just curious how Synergy and also then how Touchstone came to be. Like, what's the origin story? So why don't we start with Synergy? Okay. Um, so the origins really, um, Mike Weinstein, who's one of the founders of Synergy, um, the RFP I was telling you about earlier, he is the one who started East Valley Pavilion, which was specific to help people move from those higher levels of care. But the unique part about it was um, that we have clinical services on campus instead of just going straight to housing without having those supports. So he uh, started in 2004. Um, we took our first client in 2005 um, and we started simple. I mean, I know that um, a lot of people think we're wonderful and we really are wonderful, um, but we started out as a regular boarding care um, Maybe you, uh, we're both from Hancock Park. Um, so this is, has been a big challenge about how we got here um, with so many boarding cares close, closing. So we started as a regular boarding care and then we've added layers, you know, uh, maybe more experienced staff. Okay, we can take this. And oddly enough, we changed the flooring in our facility so we could take more clients with incontinence which that meant we could take more clients with Clausarel, which meant that we had to have more staffing to go to labs. It's like, it's really a very layered um, effect on that. And then we just kind of grew. I feel like we're pretty dialed in with what we do, our protocols, we have some great leadership now, um, which takes a long time. I mean, here we are 20 years later and it's, you know, I still worry I think everybody worries, but it, it's not a client that usually wakes me up in the middle of the night I'm worried about. Um, it's usually the systems. Um, did we get paid? How's Medi-Cal working? Um, you know, was this person dropped? You know, I haven't heard back from the conservator. It's, it's always the systems around that, you know, kind of boggle us down. But I think Synergy did start with um, a model. We went to Trieste in 2006. That was huge for us because we learned about hospitality related services. So we really do say that we are 70% hospitality, 30% mental health services. Um, and that's a model that I appreciate. Um, it's very service oriented, our food, our furniture, our landscaping, um, all of that I think is reflected in, you know, that we want people to feel the best they can. Um, and it's just grown from there. It's it's it hasn't always been easy. I will tell you that, and I'll talk about the challenges later on. Um, and also, I sent a report to all of you called the Coral Report, which is the imminent problem and dangers and issues with boarding cares closing. Um, it's been a it's been a pandemic here as far as closures. Um, so if you read that paper, I think you'll see some of the research that I. I think could be duplicated in other states. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have the numbers. It's always about the data. You know, it's the research, it's the data because data means dollars. Um, and that's really important. That's a little bit about our origins. So as I'm listening, I think that there's a special group of two kinds of listeners that are going to want to know what you have to say. One would be the group that's going, how can we start one? Mm -hmm. But then there's the other group of going, how can I get my loved one into your facility? So and I think we have an episode on Trieste as well. I 
pretty sure we we, we had did. Carrie Carrie Morrison oh, was yes. uh, Mimi invited her. weren't she, she was Mimi's neighbor. Remember? Yeah, she used to throw the <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Right. So you know we. Part of the reason we want to talk about these things is to know that if you hunt hard enough and you wait long enough, because we're going to ask you about waiting lists and, and we need to ask about cost as well, who pays for it, that there are options available. I mean, where my son is now, and I'm not going to say where it is because his name isn't even really Ben. So I don't, you know, I don't want people to find him, but I waited two years for him to be able to be housed in this place. And I'm thrilled with them. I'm not sure he is because he thinks he's perfect the way he is. And just, is, you know, he's ha he's having, having awareness issues in on many levels. So, uh, so let's, I, I want to know just a, a board and care is what like a group home. What's a board and care. <clears throat> That's a, that's a great question. A boarding care is an adult residential facility. We are licensed by Department of Social Services. Okay. It could be six beds and it could be 60, 80. And there's one that I know of that's 225. Um, but an art, the equivalent would be an assisted living place for older adults, which, you know, you have those large, beautiful assisted living communities and all those things. And, you know, they have 200, 300, 400. So it could be small or large. Okay. Can I just say what I ran into in L.A. when I was trying to p find a place for Nick to live. Uh, you say you're from Hancock Park? Is that where you're Yeah, where, Holly, where you Hollywood from? Hills and then down to Arden. Yep. Oh, you're on Arden. So I found a place that was um, on Crenshaw just below Wilshire mm -hmm. in a big old house. And this is what the board and cares. This was what I found in L.A. or old ramshackle house owned by somebody you don't know and then usually 10 to 15 people in there run by somebody else mm -hmm. and they they feed them and house them and make sure they take the medication and that's it and the place was pretty scary and every actually every boarding care that i saw in la was pretty horrifying um, it's it, it it you've obviously taken it to another level. I think a lot of them end up to be a people are making real money off of this because what happens is the the residents SSI or SSDI check goes directly to them, and um, they do what they want with it, and then they make sure that they're fed and they get their meds. So they keep it to the very lowest level of care so it, it, what i came across there i we didn't put nick there i mean i was horrified but um i i just i remember through that experience thinking there's got to be a better way jim was in a board and care in minnesota it was andrew residence ellie and it was actually a really good place um it, it was um actually an incredible place he did the best there mental health wise and physical health wise of anywhere he's ever been. Um, and they had um, good food, they had programs, but it just wasn't a good fit for him. He's a very private person and they put three people in the same room that was not like a little suite. It was just uh, like a nursing home room with three people with a curtain in between each bed. So that was a, a deal breaker for him. And um, he was younger then too, and it was mostly people older than him. Um, but we have high hopes now for Touchstone. Jim's really excited to go. Well, so let's Ellie, hear about you, that now. Your Ellie, origin story. Pardon me. So let's yeah. So let's hear about Touchstone. About your origin story, Ellie, with yeah. Touchstone. How that came. Oh yes. Out. Sure. So uh, Touchstone Mental Health was started by five social workers at the University of Minnesota in 1982. Um, at that time, there was a lot of folks with mental illness being placed inappropriately in nursing homes. Um, people 30, 40, 50, and 60 going to nursing homes just because we didn't have a board built out system, which we still don't have, but at least now we have more options in terms of supportive housing. So in 1982, they formed an LLC and they opened up their first um, apartment building and started providing supportive services. They uh, operated it for about 18 years before they turned it into a nonprofit in 1999. 
and we've had a variety of programs and but housing's always been our key um we have three residential treatment programs for people leaving the hospital, then they can stay up to 90 days. And we do a lot of community-based services, case management, care coordination. There's some new Medicaid housing services in Minnesota called housing stabilization services. And we have uh, three, house, uh, three apartment buildings currently um, that we are at 24 seven. And so those are permanent supportive housing models. So there is a property owner who's a nonprofit housing developer where the, everybody has a lease with that person. Uh, we work with uh, property owners called Aon Alliance Housing, Project for Pride and Living, and they have property management on site. And then we're on site as the prop, as the service provider 24 seven. And depending on which place it is, it could be a large one bedroom apartment. It could be an efficiency. We do have some townhomes where people share living spaces, but everyone always has their own bedroom. There's always their own kitchen and bathrooms. Um, Rising Cedar is definitely our gem. It has a lot of healing elements. Um, the design of the building. It was built in 2013 and they used a lot of uh, neuroscience in the building to look at like what colors, what shapes, what kind of spaces are needed. And it's, it's a beautiful building. It's won some architecture designs. And so we like to keep that separation between you have a lease with the property owner and we're as a service provider and we can advocate with you if you're getting a lease violation or we can advocate with the property management to say, you know, we're really concerned about this person and they're not doing well and maybe you need to give them a lease violation. So it's it's interesting to have that relationship and property management is um, really stressed after COVID. And so that's been our biggest challenge is really the turnover and the property management staff. Um, but we're working with our partners and have a lot of new partnerships in the pipeline about new supportive housing projects we're going to be working on in the future. And be happy to talk about that later. All right. Thank you. So believe it or not, we're a half an hour in already. So I'm going to jump to the money question. So I know that when my, my book came out and I did sort of a book tour, I was invited to speak at places and I saw places that were funded by the state. I saw places that were paid for with people's SSI and SSDI checks I saw places that cost $8,000 a month for wealthy families. So where do your housing solutions fit in there? And how can someone who is not a family of means hope to find some kind of housing for their loved ones? Well, I can start. All of our housing is for low-income people. Uh, some of the units are reserved for people experiencing homelessness, but not all of them. Um, so most of our rents are one-third of a person's income. And that's through, we, we operate maybe eight different subsidies. So it could be a VASH subsidy if you're a veteran. It could be a Section 8 subsidy. We have some of those available. It could be um, something called a continuum of care subsidy, but we don't actually make, we we just, we fit the person to the unit that has the subsidy available. So that's kind of um, invisible to someone moving in. We kind of figure out like, this is what where you fit. So it's a third of your income for rent. Um, the services are all paid through Medicaid. Either you're, some people get Medicaid in Minnesota through a prepaid medical assistance plan like Health Partners, you know, or UCARE, or there's different companies. We have contracts with all of those. Some of our programs, you need to be on a Medicaid waiver, and that means there's additional benefits that are available than the regular benefit set of Medicaid. And so Rising Cedar, all of the people that go to that program need to have a waiver, a caddy waiver that pays a daily rate for us to provide services. Some of our new programs we're opening up. So one of them we have called Minnehaha Commons. It's for people 55 and older, and everybody there has to come from experiencing homelessness, which unfortunately in Minnesota, and I think across the country, that's our largest segment of population as people um, over 55 experiencing homelessness. At that program, we are, we are primarily housing first. You don't have to say you have a mental illness. You don't have to have a diagnostic assessment. You don't even have to have insurance. We take a lot of people that are straight from the street and, and we help them get on insurance. And uh, that that program doesn't um, 
break even yet. <laughs> uh, you know, we bill insurance whenever possible. I write grants. I get independent funding. But we have to meet people where they're at if we really want to solve the homelessness crisis. And so, like, Rising Cedar is a great model, but you have to be able to say, yes, I have a diagnosis of a mental illness. Yes, I have a waiver. Yes, I want 24-7 care. Yes, I'll work with Touchstone. And that works for some people. It does not work for a lot of people that say, you know what, I don't have a mental illness and I'm not going to take services from you at Touchstone. So our program at Minnehaha Commons has 44 efficiency apartments. We're there 24-7. I'd say 23 of them are officially enrolled, receiving services. And we work with everyone in that building, whether they're enrolled in services or not. And it's so important to solve the homelessness crisis to figure out. And like we had a man who was there for three years before he said, you know, you told me that you thought a psychiatrist would be a good idea. I think I'm ready to see a psychiatrist. Three wow. years. And wow. so it's great to be able to give that amount of time for folks. And he's actually doing much better now taking medications and, and feel, you know, not feeling as, you know, I, I always feel like people, um, suffer so much longer than they need to because of sometimes the inability to take the help when it's offered and offering kind of a trauma-informed care environment where we'll meet you when you're at, we'll keep offering, we're here. And as long as you're not violating the lease, you're paying your rent, you're not fighting with the other tenants. And even if you are fighting with the other tenants, there's sometimes we can mitigate some of that. Um, but so we have a couple different models depending on um, what people need. And so our next one we're building with Alliance Housing is 59 units. And same thing, not everybody is going to have to agree to services, but we're actually going to try and have a larger mix out because it's 59 units. We're hoping at least 40 of the folks coming in will agree and kind of will screen people and say, you know, we're really encouraging people to take services from Touchstone, just trying to find the right mix. Yeah. And just before we go on to Linda, is there a waiting list? Yes. Um, you know, people have waited as long as three years to get in Rising Cedar. Sometimes it's as short as six months. It just really depends on a lot of different factors. Um, so um, yes. And like at Minnehaha Commons, since everyone has to come from homelessness, sometimes it's even getting documentation on verifying someone's status of experiencing homelessness, which seems ridiculous that that's verification you need to get, but it is. All right, thank you. Linda, how about how about you? Okay, well, I take it back. Ellie, don't come out to California. I'm coming out to your place. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see all this. It's like really exciting. I can just figure I can't even imagine like eight different subsidies. Um, I feel like we're we're far less complicated in a lot of more ways. Um, so we a little bit of a different, not a different population, but maybe you know our clients, you know, will come to a program like that, and we have a little bit of independent supported housing on our campuses of our licensed care. So first goal is get them out of that secured setting. I just looked at my report and I have 65 individuals on my referral list. And I call it a referral list because um, everybody is not ready. And I think kind of stepping back, one of the models that we began um, is we follow a modified therapeutic community. So we really do try and have as much evidence-based practices as possible. Um, I'll send you the summary page about a modified therapeutic community. It's been studied for years. There's, there's different phases. There's four phases. We use three of the phases because that's what worked for us. Um, it was too limiting otherwise. Um, so that first phase is called client development. That's what I manage. I manage our contracts and I manage our client development. So that piece is the, um, we go out to all these locked facilities throughout California and we meet with people. We develop them to be our future clients. We engage them. We tell them what we have to offer. Some people say, heck no, I don't want to go. Um, a, a lot of people do want to come. So that not everybody is ready. I think the longest client um, that we worked with from a county uh, referral was four years. And we went every two months, every three months, you know, to do really well. 
and get up to that discharge point. And then I'm going to say sabotage because I'm not a clinician, so I can say that. <laughs> but uh, things would fall apart. She went back to the, the high level behavioral health unit and then she would work her way back up again. So that's that's like the extreme. So she was on our referral list for four years. Other individuals, probably two to six months. And some people, you know, they might meet my criteria, which I don't feel is really stringent. And But maybe they haven't taken a shower in three months, four months. It's not fair to bring somebody to our program with an expectation of taking a shower at minimum every other day when they're like three months. So that's something that we work with the person where they're at. Um, so that that referral list. Now, some of the clients, some of our county partners haven't bought into that. Is it a yes or a no? And if it's a no, we're going to go on to somebody else. However, I do feel like, you know, that we're, we have been successful with clients. Um, I understand get them out, get them out, get them out. We're also trying to be, we're, we want them to admit to our program and benefit from our program. And so that pre-work, that's the modified therapeutic community piece. And that also has, so I have my licensed boarding care and then adjacent, I have a specialty mental health outpatient clinic. So that's where I bill the Medi-Cal services from. Um, Medi-Cal Social Security for our state, it's $1,398 for the boarding care. And then the county, out of county general funds, which I'm going to start calling a subsidy because I like the way you said that. I think it would probably be continuity of care subsidy. The county pays us anywhere from $140 a day to $177 a day. And that is providing, you know, medication management, um, taking you to labs, the food, the snacks, the housing piece, um, incontinent care, whatever that looks like. And then they can move to our supported housing program. So it's SSI, Medi-Cal, county general funds. So property taxes, sales, permits, fees, things like that, all bundled together. Um, and then they can graduate to our independent supported housing program. It's called the Tray Vista model. And again, evidence-based practices, you know, we are not rocket scientists. SAMHSA, you know, has a model called ACT, Assertive, Assertive Community Treatment. So we've had some bumps on the road, but the more I see us evolve, the more and more tight that we are really attuning ourselves to that ACT model. So right now, and Mike Weinstein really is um, a huge driver of this. We have one, it's a one to 10 ratio. One MHRS, mental health rehabilitation support specialist for every 10 clients. So they are really engaging seven wow. days a week, eight hours a day. All that, right. Thank you. Yeah. Some of it's billable, some of it's not. Um, and I hate saying billing for your life, but this is how we get paid. This is how we pay our six psychiatrists and our therapists and, and that robust mental health services. Um, so it is a do you to, could I ask, um, do you either one of your organizations also fundraise besides all the government? I know that uh, Touchstone does, but could you talk a little bit about what kind of a gap it is that you have to fill with fundraising? Yeah, so, so if you're not if you're not watching on YouTube, Linda just shook her head no and no. Linda just shook her head yes. So just giving you the visual. So, so different and then than, I think Mimi has a, a question after this. Different than Touchstone, um, we are a for profit. We are an S corp. So I don't have the opportunity to fundraise and do that. Um, however, the state of California did release five hundred and seventy million dollars, and they did open it up to private entities. I think they're personally calling us private entities because nobody wants to say for profit, but, but so we're a private entity and we did receive $8 million for an older adult program. Um, so I fundraising doesn't um, mean anything to us, but Ellie, you're a yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we've, um, we're a nonprofit. And so uh, our budget's around 17 and a half million dollars and about a million of a, and a half of that 1.5 million I fundraise through grants, foundations, individuals. And we also do get a lot of in-kind donations. So move in baskets for people moving into their apartments, hygiene items, blankets, quilts. Um, so all of those types of drives, which are really helpful when people move into their own apartments. So 
We also serve about 700 people that live in their own apartments. And um, some of that's through case management, through a, a Medicaid service called ARMS, Adult Rehab Mental Health Services. And so a lot of those folks, we help move from apartment to apartment. Um, we administer some rental subsidies through the state of Minnesota as well to help make people's rent affordable. Um, and so a lot of that, um, the fee for service aspect of mental health services, one, a lot of times it doesn't pay for a lot of the like collateral work, helping find um, new places to live or some of the collateral contacts. So um, just fundraising for those pieces as well to just the, some of the wraparound services. Okay. Mimi. Well, you know, what I am wondering about is, you know, um, a lot of people who listen to us and a lot of people who I know have children with SMI who and have them living with them mm -hmm. or in unsupportive apartments that they pay for themselves. And um, all both those things are dependent on having healthy parent caregivers and also of means. Um, as these caregivers, as in me, age, it's a huge worry about what's going to happen to my kid when I die. And I mean, that's the thing that I think about a lot and that one of the main things that people ask me about. Is anyone in your um, facilities or your organizations planning or thinking about this probably really large group of baby ba baby boomer parents, kids who we're all going to croak and they're all going to be you know, with a life expectancy of another 20, 30 years, like what's going to happen to those kids or are they going to just end up homeless? We have already had some of those folks move into our supportive housing programs. And unfortunately, we've also had people experience homelessness because of a parent death and didn't pay the mortgage, didn't know they needed to pay the mortgage, house foreclosed, that kind of stuff. Um, and when someone's experiencing homelessness in Hennepin County, you go through a system called coordinated entry services and they determine like how, what the priority of homelessness is. And so a lot of times if there's an individual who had been housed most of their life and had a short period of homelessness, but needed some mental health support, um, there are, there are a number of supportive housing programs in, in the twin cities in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but we've already started to see some folks like this, who have been living with their parents or living in an apartment that their parents paid for. The only time it has been problematic because we work with, we only work with low income people at Touchstone because of how, you know, we occasionally have a private pay person, but it's really like, you know, out of the 1600 people we work with like one or two. So if a trust hasn't been established and someone ends up with a lot of assets and it messes up their Medicaid or they weren't on Medicaid and their parents were paying. So you have to spend down those assets before you become eligible. So we have seen situations like that um, where family members have helped people <laughs> spend down their assets really quickly to have them be eligible. And so, I mean, it, I it's so good, you know, for you guys to be talking about trust and to be talking about if there is a guardianship situation, getting some of that stuff. Um, and if you've always managed the money, setting up a rep payee for somebody prior, you know, to making those arrangements, because we're, we, you know, we all have finite time on this earth. So uh, those are the things that are helpful for, you know, make, making referrals to, uh, to us and, um, you know, there's an asset limit, unfortunately, of $3,000. And we've even had people like, you know, it's Minnesota. So they had a ski do that was worth $12,000. That counts against your asset limit. So maybe your brother's going to own that for you. I mean, there's just like a lot of things that can get in the way that if a family had been taking care of all of those pieces, it, it can take us years sometimes to untangle that and help somebody get the services that they need. Um, and certainly if someone has funds to private pay and um, they can private pay for, you know, they can pay the full rent amount, which is the fair market rent, which in, in Minnesota isn't horrible, but it's still like $1,100 a month for an apartment and then paying for services. 
Um, that is one way you can spend down your assets is just paying for services until you qualify for Medicaid. And we've seen that happen as well. Usually it only takes eight or nine months for someone to spend down all of the assets um, that they have before they qualify for Medicaid. So as much as a family can do to shore up the financials prior um, to, you know, and letting people test living out on their own, um, you know, so that you, you can see them being successful in, in an environment is helpful, I think. What I and it's really, tough. Yeah. And what I really like about what I'm hearing is this sort of step-by-step -step approach. I know that right now, as, as you know, my son is not doing well. And I think it was partly because he went from a jail diversion program where everything was spelled out for him. Now you go to group. Now you do this. Now you do that. And he earned his way to get passes, to visit the family. And with that structure, he did amazingly well. Unfortunately, when he moved into this, this housing, it was sort of straight into his own apartment and it took time to get him involved and he's not yet involved. And he just turned to the wrong kind of people that he met on the street. So. I, I I'll, I'll say two things. Um, <clears throat> the, again, following that UCSF, uh, study the um, invisible population project is important because we need to see what comes of that. The individuals that are living at home. I mean, over 20 years, I I feel like you know I know that we hear about unserved and underserved. Where I see you know individuals with um, families with resources, they're the ones who fall through the cracks because insurance is never going to pay for housing. And yet they're not part of the system of care. Um, and so it's really challenging to not be part of the system of care and to receive these subsidies. Um, they're in California. I don't know if they're national. I just don't know, but I see them all the time. I was just at the NAMI California conference last week as an organization called Proxy Parent. And it is kind of like what it sounds like. Um, once you pass away or even before they have case management and they support the, um, that individual after you are gone. Um, so trusts are important, but usually the trust is not enacted until you unfortunately die. <laughs> so you have to do some things beforehand. Um, and, you know, to, to what Elia is saying, you know, figure out how to do these funds without resources. Um, most people, my clients with severe mental illness, um, are not going to be able to, to at this time coming out of a lock setting, have a job. Now out of 250 clients that I serve, um, I would say probably 235 are LPS conserved. It's a special type of conservatorship in California. You do not have to be in a locked facility to be LPS conserved. It's a safety net. And it's renewed every year and it's assessed every year. Um, but the more we look at this, because, and, and to your point, I think that we're going to find there's 250,000 individuals that without that family support and living with them, they're not on anybody's radar right now. These are the boomer parents. I'm a boomer. So I think it's tragic when somebody ends up being taken care of their entire life and there's up to their sixties and seventies and then nothing, you know, yeah. the, the parent passes away. Those are the most challenging. And those are individuals that I usually see end up in secured settings because they just do not know what to do with themselves. Their medications are a mess. Their medical is a mess. Um, so I think it's an awareness and that's, I mean, honestly, I appreciate you doing this because it's it's going to, I mean, it, we all know the homeless situation right now or the unhoused um, situation. And I feel like it's only going to get worse and all the boarding cares are closed. Many boarding cares are closing in California. The resources are really limited. So one of your, you know, things we talked about is, you know, what, what do you want to do? change about your program, we need to build more supported housing for my clients to step down to. So asking somebody with schizophrenia, with secondary mild to moderate intellectual disabilities, and then insulin dependent diabetics, I, I would love for everyone to have their own apartment, but some people need that support. Um, 
also, I, I think congregate living has to stop being this horrible thing. You know, I lived in three intentional communities. And if it's a, if we're talking about a kibbutz, it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. We're all living on kibbutz, you know, right. and somehow if all of these people living together on a campus, it's like this negative thing. It's just, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I, it's, I think you make very good points. I serve on the board of Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance, and we just recently got the results of a survey that we did. I think it was of caregivers. And the number one concern is housing. Yeah. What Mimi's question, what will happen to my child when I die or how will they have housing so they can have more independence. I mean, it's not a normal thing to be living with your parents, especially older parents, and you're getting older as well. Um, Ellie knows that Jim was on the waiting list for um, Touchstone for three years, and we never heard a word. So then um, he ended up in his apartment like your son, Randy, and it has been disastrous. He's um, He and his girlfriend sublet it to a drug dealer and Jim wasn't even living there. He was shacked up with his girlfriend using crack and his apartment was just being used by a drug dealer. I mean, it's, and then we could get not, the mental health system wouldn't help get the drug dealer out. They turned to me, the mother and said, that's, you need to do that. And um, they finally, did do it, but only after me uh, having many uh, discussions. <laughs> but um, but Jim is at our house most of the time. This summer, as listeners know, he had pneumonia. I'm convinced if he had been in his apartment, he would be dead because he um, eventually, after four days, he was here at our house. So we did not know. He did not know he was coming down with pneumonia. His This girlfriend I just mentioned had just died. So we thought he was depressed about that and went to bed. He didn't have a cough. He didn't have a fever. Um, but it, when he finally needed to go to the hospital by ambulance, he had, uh, he couldn't walk. He couldn't talk coherently. We couldn't understand a word he was saying. So if he'd been in his apartment, his caddy waiver person, um, tax him. And then if he doesn't answer, that's the end of that. He has a behavioral health home specialist who sees him once a month. She had just seen him. So she wouldn't see him again for another month. So I think he would be dead in this apartment. So we're trying to get ahead of the game. So I have a question for you, Ellie, because you mentioned um, that some of the places that Touchstone has, it has to be people who are homeless. And of course, we all want people who don't have housing to be housed. We've had people on this program talking about that very problem. Um, but, you know, and we don't want to pit one needy group against another needy group. But, of course, we are advocating for people with schizophrenia. And I think that's a very needy group, whether they're housed or unhoused. Many of them are are unhoused and many of them are using chemicals, whether they're housed or not. But how can families get ahead of the curve so we don't have to die and have our children end up on the streets? They might die there before they get into supportive housing because by then they're really helpless, um, not streetwise. How can we, uh, as families advocating and planning ahead and you know, I want Jim, and now he's one of the lucky ones that is going to get to go to Rising Cedar, and hopefully he can succeed there and become more independent, have more friends, and we can just be parents. But how can others? How, that would be amazing. What do we and do I about this conundrum of having to be unhoused. It's a wonderful question. And I just want to remind everybody that we're at an hour or over an hour now. Oh <laughs> so if we can make these answers short, and uh, I know it's a, it's a big question, it's, and maybe we'll have you back just to talk about this. But if you can answer that, I think some of it has already been answered, but I'd like to hear your answer to that. And also the last question we'll be asking is, if people in other states are going, oh my God, I want to build something like this too. What would you say to them? And are they able to contact you for advice or how does that work? So that would be, I'll let you each answer both of those. Yeah. So uh, the national group that I would direct people to is called the Corporation for Supportive Housing, csh.org. 
Uh, they do a great job and they work across many states to help people figure out who want to build affordable housing and have permanent supportive housing. And they have a lot of like technical assistance and trainings. Um, and they're a really great resource. And they've actually helped quite a few programs in Minnesota. Um, and I would say for us, we make sure with every one of our housing projects that we have some units that are available for folks to move into that aren't experiencing homelessness. And one of the ones that will be opening up in a few years um, with um, Common Bond um, and another one with Aon, we're really, they're called, um, you know, all these federal terms, but they're called P T PWB, people with disabilities, and we can have people with mental illness. And so we can um, set aside some of the units in our future housing to only go to people with disabilities. And so, you know, we're always trying to have a mix so that we can meet the community need. Certainly there's a lot of people with untreated mental illness on the in the streets and that those are folks we're working with, people coming from family homes, people coming from residential treatment programs, and people coming from facilities like Andrew or Borden Lodge or Borden Care facilities that really just want their own apartment and are ready for that. So we do try and have a mix so that we, none of our projects besides Minnehaha Commons everyone has to be over 55 and experiencing homelessness, there's some flexibility built in. So we'll continue to build that flexibility as we build future projects. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. And I love the term intentional, the term intentional communities. That's I've never heard that before. And I just love the thought of that. Linda, your final words too. Although you're, you're muted. muted. Yeah, they used to be called communes, and uh, so they flipped it. You know, they they niced it up a little bit by intentional community, but it still holds true. Um, so I would say for for us, you know, this is a group of three individuals that are doing this all on their own. They are the company, they are the the corporation. So it's not some large organization. Although I appreciate knowing from LA from eighty two to nineteen ninety nine, then you change to a nonprofit. So you know, if we grow, I could see that. Um, so I have personally mentioned Rachel. So I went out and saw Rachel and met with a lot of her group and her advocates um, about how do you create a synergy? Um, I have spoken in Texas. I have spoken in Colorado, recently in Wyoming about some of the fundamentals. But at the end of the day, for our model to work, it has to be hospitality. So you can build it, but how you how you treat people, um, I can't teach someone to be nice and be hospitable. And I think that that's where some people get stuck a little bit. Uh, but yes, they absolutely can contact me. We do a presentation. Um, we are a consultant for a county right now because they too want to uh, mimic what we do. So that's um, that's pretty nice. So we are doing consulting also. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has given, it's been very enlightening and it's, I think it helps all families to know that there are possibilities out there. You may have to hunt for them. And again, one of the episodes we did was a, a book about that had influenced just the guidebook, Nicole Gillen, forgot her last name, but there, she worked on this guidebook for resources for families. So we want to be a resource for you. And certainly, Allie and Linda, you have been fantastic tonight. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. I mean, so grateful that you love your work and it shows and you're helping people like our sons and families like ours and giving us hope. And thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randykay.com.